All right. Peace, love, and light, family. It's your girl, Morgan Renee Myers. Tuning in with you all for another story time with more of my it has been quite some time honey quite some time we are in still <laughs> we about three four months still into this daggone book because my life my schedule has been hectic if you see me looking around it's because i'm recording on three different phones one for my instagram one for my facebook and one for my youtube so anywho yeah i this is this is why I need to keep doing this to keep me accountable. We literally have been in this book for about at least three months. I know I was watching, I was looking at my page. I posted back in April, May, skipped the whole month. Then it was June. Now it's been over a month since then. So I'm going to go ahead and get through chapter 15 so we can finish this book. It ain't many left because I have another book that I want to bring to us by a black author. That's totally different um, genre. It's nonfiction. Um, and it's called Centered, Trading Your Plans for a Life That Matters by Jason Brown, who is a former NFL player that now owns a family farm that I have recently visited, and that's how I purchased his book and met with the brother. So yeah, anywho, let's just hop into it. I can't do a recap because I don't remember what all happened. I do know up until this point... Winter had got into some stuff, went to San Diego, the teenager, was in a group home or something or another, juvenile, someplace for uh, at-risk use, and she ends up getting into it with one of the girls, and they try to jump her or something, and the other girl comes and warns her after she stays out all night, and I don't remember. But let's see, chapter 15. The Jamaican spot around the corner got a break at, got, excuse me, let me start over. The coldest winter ever by Sister Soldier chapter 15 the jamaican spot around the corner got to break my last 20 two patties ginger beer and two blunts the speed of my thoughts increased then doubled i had to make a move soon according to my calculations gs will be should be coming around any day now it was unlike him to let four days go by without showing up even though i had about five plans brewing i felt real uneasy staying at their house had me out of my element like a true Santiago, I could figure something out when my back was against the wall, but this living arrangement didn't leave me a lot of options. First off, I was never left alone. Second, I had no need to feed off. I had no one to feed off of. <clears throat> what I needed was a connection. It was like right there in front of my face, but I couldn't hook up the main line. Careful thoughts led me to conclude that Soldier was cock blocking. She was interrupting my connection to midnight in GS. She was clogging up my flow. When I stepped back into the crib, I knocked on Doc's office door. She came to answer the door, opening it up only slightly. My secretary quit. It's real hectic in here. We can't talk now. She closed the door in a hurry. As I turned the knob to Soldier's apartment, I wished that I had not. I walked right into one of those womanhood meetings. I tried to shut the door swiftly, hoping no one saw me. But Lauren pulled the knob from her side and said sarcastically, Sasha, come on in. I saved the chair just for you. As I saw all the girls seated in a circle, Lauren locked eyes with me. She kept making funny faces and gestures because she had busted me trying to get out of a meeting. Both of us hated. How many of you have figured out the answer to the question? What do I believe? Who knows the answer to the question? What do I live for? Who thought about the question? What would I sacrifice my life for? I sacrificed my life for my family, one girl said. In what way? If somebody was messing with my sister, I kicked their ass. If somebody killed my brother, I try my best to kill them, even if it killed me. Well, all right. Oh, wait a minute. Even if it killed me. Oh, are you and your sister tight? Soldier X setting the girl up for the kill. We all right, the girl responded. After a small pause, the girl continued. It doesn't matter if me and my sister are tight. The fact is that she's my sister, and if anybody puts their hands on her, then they're going to be thumping. How about for a cause? Would you fight for a cause? Latricia, excuse me. <laughs> I'm reading, uh, I'm looking up and seeing, and I didn't even say her name right. I'm seeing stuff. Let me pay attention. Peace, everybody. Thank you for joining. All right, so she said, how about for a cause? Would you fight for a cause? Soldier asked, what kind of cause? The girl asked cautiously. Say, for instance, the school in your neighborhood didn't have the right books for the children to learn. Or say they needed computers or even healthier food in the cafeteria. 
The girl seemed to sense that this might be a trap, so she thought before she answered, then blurted out, No, I'm not getting involved in all that. That's different. If somebody's beating my sister up or cheating her out of money, that's different, because that's like an emergency. What about you? Soldier asked the next girl. If my sister was in the school, then maybe I'd do something, the girl said. But why would your sister have to be in school for you to fight for the school? Because my sister is my family. My family. I don't know those other kids, she said with attitude. But the school is in your community. Even if your sister isn't in that school, your sister still has to live in the neighborhood. She will be affected by whatever happens to those other children. If they don't get proper education, maybe one of them will bust a cap in your sister's ass. Then what? Silence fell for three seconds. Then the girl said, then I'll bust a cap in their ass. Everybody laughed. Soldier pulled out a blackboard and started gibbering about how we all family. We are all connected. We have to look out for one another in our schools and neighborhoods. We have to make anybody who makes money in our neighborhood accountable to us who live here. As far as I'm concerned, this whole topic was a waste of time. The girl was right. If somebody touched my family, then family touches them back. If somebody fucks with the money in my pocket, then it's grounds for war. How are we all connected when all of us live in separate places? I bet none of these chicks lived in an apartment as laced as soldiers. When you get a bill in the mail, it ain't a wee thing. When I buy, buy clothes, they ain't for we. They for me. I live for me. I die for me. Luckily, Doc interrupted the meeting. She pulled Lauren out into the hallway and I followed. Listen, Lauren, she said, I need a big favor. Can you fill in tomorrow until I hire a new secretary? Lauren didn't look enthusiastic. But I work up here, Lauren said. Soldier won't mind if I borrow you. My office is swamped. I'll talk to her. She'll understand. Doc put the pressure on her. All right, then, Lauren agreed. Back inside, Soldier was still grilling the girls. How will we as women get along with one another in our communities if we can't agree on the rules? She asked. What rules? One of the girls questioned. How should we treat each other? How should we speak to one another and about each other? What about our men? How should we treat them? How should we require them to treat us? What could we change about our own actions to cause them to treat all of us better? Will we continue to sleep with each other's men and fight and lie about it? What do, you, what do we believe? How will we raise our children? What will we tell them? Soldier was shooting those questions like rapid fire. It was clear to me that she wanted to control everything and everybody. That's it. She was a definite control freak. Late that night, when GS rang the bell, I beat my record time getting down the stairs. What up, Sash? He said, like I had him trained to say. You know what's up, nigga? I responded in my playful, sexy way. I knew you come around looking for me. Slide me a number so we can talk. You know, just me and you. I smiled wild, wide and stuck my tongue out. I smiled wide and stuck my tongue out a little on my teeth. <laughs> That's what one of us doing. <laughs> that girl's silly. You crazy, he said, laughing. Soldier here. Steam my smile turned to tight lips. Okay. You crazy, he said, laughing. Soldier here. Steamed my smile turned to tight lips. Stop playing, GS. You know what's up. We don't have to do this here, but we definitely got to do this. G.S. brushed past me, pushing me to the side. As he headed up the stairs, I ran close behind him and grabbed his shoulder. He jerked his shoulder back, shoving me off. Shoving me off. At the top landing of the flight, first flight of stairs, I pushed him. He pushed me back. Look, girl, you want to get fucked? I'll fuck you, but don't trip in her house. I ain't checking for that. In the dark shadows of the stairs, Soldier appeared. Wow. Ooh. With her eyes cutting through the darkness like a cat, she asked, Is everything straight? Looking at G.S. Everything's cool, he said in a raspy, low voice. Peace, Sasha, Soldier said as they left. But in them two words, a lot more was hidden. Upstairs, Lauren was waiting. I was so vexed. I didn't feel like swapping stories with her now. What's wrong, she asked. Was that G.S.? What did he say? That motherfucker didn't say nothing. He acted like I was wilding out, like he didn't know what's up. Well, what do you expect him to do with Soldier right here in the house? What you gotta do, what you gotta do is get him one on one. I already did that, I said, calm but angry. Did you get his number? No. How about the beeper? Nope, nothing. Damn, you fucked up. How did that happen? You didn't get nothing? What the hell was you doing up there in his room? I guess we was a little too busy to talk, I laughed half heartedly. Where did you go? I asked her. 
I was with Frankie till about five. Then he said he had to pick up GS. So I told him to drop me off. He didn't drop you here because you wasn't here when I got here. Yeah, he dropped me off at Cameron's house. Who's Cameron? The other dude I know. What did Frankie say about that? What could he say? He don't know me. I told him it was my mother's apartment. We laughed again. Frankie won't see me no more, no how. Once he told me he was GS's personal bodyguard, I decided to cut his ass off. I don't need my business getting back to my sister. While Lauren slept, I sat up all night. When I heard Soldier coming up the stairs, it was about 4 a.m. I only heard one set of footsteps. I decided to confront her in the darkened hallway with my nightgown on. So was GS your friend? I questioned. I mean, so is GS your man? I questioned her. No, we're just friends, she said with no hostility. So how come you two are always together? We like each other, but we both know it wouldn't work out. Besides, he's leaving on tour tomorrow. She checked the time and said, I mean today. We were just saying goodbye. Why do you ask? I guess I didn't answer quick enough because she started talking again. I thought you had something for him, she said. Like she was pleased with herself for knowing things before they happened. But if I did, it wouldn't matter to you, would it? I asked. It would, because I have feelings for him, but I wouldn't try to stop the two of you because he's not my man. Come on in. We walked into her bedroom. Sit down, she said. GS is an entertainer. I told myself there's two kind of men I would never marry, a performer or a preacher. Why? I asked, thinking, damn, who said anything about marriage anyway? Because you have to show yourself as a woman. You have to know that you want you have to know what you want out of love and what you don't want. You have to know what you expect and what you're willing to accept or compromise. Now now a million women are in love with GS, or at least think they are. Whatever girl eventually gets him can never be happy. Her man will be hunted and desired by so many women, other, so many other women. Everyone will see her as the person who's in the way, the person they need to get rid of. A man like GS would have to work over time to convince the woman he chooses that he really loves her that he really will be faithful for the most part he'll probably try he'll say no to a thousand girls then there will just then there will be just that one someone with a beautiful face like yours sasha a perfect figure and pretty toes and he'll say yes to her or let's say he's faithful half the time he'll be on the road you would have to be the kind of woman who doesn't mind being left alone half of the time that's not me that's not what i want then with the performance you never know anyway her voice lowered to a whisper this was like type top secret information never know what a lot of them are bisexual they look like men dress like men talk like men are surrounded by women but they sleep with men also not gs i blurted out you never know she said that's why you gotta watch for a long time before you jump into bed with someone it's not what they say that gives them away it's what they do and how they do it i watch closely most things are not what they seem to be in this life most people are not what they seem to be in this life most people find it extremely hard to tell the truth about themselves living has taught me that soldier was undressing as she spoke it was as if i wasn't even standing there yo that's so real though uh i messed around with a dude who i think in hindsight was on the dl i have some substantiating evidence that could prove that um but he definitely tried to be the macho type and excuse me based on some conversations he had i feel like maybe he wasn't comfortable coming out and expressing um his sexuality or or even if he was like not comfortable with what he was liking like he wasn't you know i don't think he felt like he had a safe space to really express that but yeah looking back when i see like it was less about what he said and more about his actions i'm like wow and if y'all ever read sister soldier's autobiography called no disrespect she speaks on um she speaks on polygamy but i think she mentions too something about that about the download brothers and it's alarming all right so so who is good enough to be your man I don't really think of it that way. I look at it as when I meet the man for me, I'll know it. I'll feel it and he will too. But even when I feel it and know it, I'll wait and watch for a good while. But if you like GS, give it your best shot if that's what you really want. As she sat down on the round bed in her bra and panties under the dim light, my mind raced to figure out the riddle she was speaking in. She was like the kid around the block who you get all pumped up to fight. You take off your earrings, necklace, pull back your hair, and Vaseline your face. You give her your best punch. Then she wouldn't hit you back. It just took the fun out of everything. So what's up with the digits? I asked on my way out of her bedroom door. What digits? 
Oh, I thought you hook up. I thought you hook a girlfriend up with GS's phone number. Come on now. I'm nice, but I'm not stupid. If you want to hook up with GS, you'll have to work it out on your own between the two of you. The next afternoon, I worked on Lauren. I needed her to get in touch with Frankie. He would know how to hook me up with GS. I had thought about it, and the idea of going on tour with him was getting me all worked up. I mean, I'm realistic. The nigga don't have to marry me straight off. We could just travel, spend money, and enjoy our and enjoy our fame. The other chicks didn't matter as long as I control his pockets. Once I got on the road, I would be unstoppable. I'd be out of this prison, have access to the dough, and I'd be meeting real, not broke down ghetto girls or chicks in turbans or philosophers or wannabes. I would learn the game, whatever the game was, because I was a fast learner. Right about now, I was giving GS the benefit of the doubt. Okay, I shouldn't have played up to him in the house where he couldn't act natural. I should have waited, set the scene and the mood, but I was going to give him a second chance to make the smartest move of his life. I don't want to talk to Frankie. I already told you that. That was Lauren's response to my pushing her. Come on, just do me a solid. Girl, you know I would do it for you. I sensed that maybe she was reluctant to get GS's num phone number from Frankie because of her sister. I tried to put Lauren at ease. Look. Soldier told me to go for mine with GS. No, she didn't, she said with disbelief. Yes, yeah, she did. Last night we was up talking. When? She never told me to go for mine with GS. Lauren's words were laced with jealousy. Whatever, Lauren. Look, are you going to do this or not? What makes you think Frankie's going to give me GS's number anyway? She asked me. If he's GS's body's guard, he should be right there with him. He could just pass him the phone. All I need is five minutes. Five minutes, and I know I could persuade GS of some things. All right, but Frankie is an asshole. He's on his own dick too hard, but I'll do it. Go in Soldier's room and pick up the phone. I'll call him on this phone. You listen and write down the number if we can get him to give it to us. Lauren got Frankie on the phone. Frankie, what's up, baby? Who this? This Lauren. Lauren from New York or Lauren from Philly? Lauren with the chinky eyes and the sweet New York pussy. Ah, oh, shit. I know that's right. Damn, you miss a nigga already, huh? Well, you know how I be. What you got on right now? Nothing but black leather belt around my waist to spank your bad ass with. Yeah, this is my freak. Like to tie a nigga up and all that. So where you headed? Lauren asked. North Carolina. We got a show there tonight. You should have called me yesterday. I'd have brought your ass with me. Where GS at? What you asking for that nigga for? I'm not asking for him. Sounds like you asking for him to me. Nah, she denied it. We on the tour bus. That nigga's in the plane riding first class. Oh, well, where are y'all staying at down in Kakalaki? Some of us will be at the Hyatt Regency. Others of us will be at the fucking Best Western. Ain't that right, dogs? Everybody started laughing. I could hear male voices in the background through the phone. Well, which hotel are you staying at? Why, are you coming to see me? No surprise, brother. Let me know. Maybe. Are you staying with GS? I asked him. There you go again. Tony, tell this little freak how much we hate bitches using us to get the GS. Yo, this is Tony. Why you trying to play my man? Put Frankie back on the phone, Lauren said in an aggravated tone. Well, who do you want to talk to, Frankie or GS? Tony teased. I want to talk to Frankie. Are you sure? Frankie X, back on the phone. <laughs> uh, let's see. Wait. Are you sure? Frankie X, back on the phone. Make that little noise you made, you was making the other night. Lauren started moaning in the, on the phone. She sounded like a cross between a snake and an owl, but Frankie loved it. Now, you remember who you with? Frankie asked. I was asking for a friend, Lauren said. Oh, dog, she asking about GS for her friend. They all started laughing wild. We could hear them loud and clear. Oh, so your friend want to get stretched out by GS? She got any friends? If we hook up with G, she got to serve the rest of us too or bring some freaks with her. <laughs> These guys. <laughs> I ran back into the bedroom to coach Lauren on what to say. Tell him to set up the meeting. We'll meet we'll meet them down there, I told her. In North Carolina? Lauren asked me, whispering. Why not? I asked, rushing her to set it up. You got money to go to North Carolina? Lauren asked sarcastically. No, but I can get some. I'm going to see my mother today. She got some money for me. I lied. Yo, Lauren, is Shorty there with you? Frankie asked. Yes, yeah, Sasha. You know from the party the other night at GS's house? The one we the one who won the pageant? Frankie guessed. 
What is he saying? What is he saying? I asked Lauren. She didn't answer. So I ran back to the soldier's room and picked up the other phone. Lauren, between you and me, if she's fiending for the dick, it's Tony she should be talking to. He's the one who fucked her. Ain't that right, dog? Who that? Tony voice asked in the distance. You remember that little freak we played Switch with the other night at the Alpine video shoot? Do I remember? Tell that bitch I love her. Lauren dropped the phone. Within a second, she was standing in Soldier's room, looking in my face, feeling sorry for me. I held the phone to my ear, frozen in position. Yeah, baby, this is Tony. I know you thought I was GS, but the good news is I don't have to explain to you what good dick you would have been missing. Fuck that nigga G. What you need to do is come get with me. They all laughed at his cheap rhyme. You lying motherfucker, I screamed at him. All right, then. When you came in the room, I was on the bed waiting in the dark. You couldn't even find the light. You started knocking shit over. You tried to suck a sip out of my crystal bottle, but I had already drank it all. But here's the hook. You got long, pretty legs, big titties like cantaloupes, a small, tight waist, and you love to go horseback riding. They all started cracking up. I love you. I love you, girl. Let's do it again. Vendetta is the word, except it isn't strong enough. That afternoon, while Lauren worked in Doc's office, I sat and talked with her. That conversation cost her $300 because that's how much I lifted from Doc's strong box without Lauren even knowing it. Seems like everybody around here got something to prove, but these bitches were not going to outsmart Winter San Diego. The next day was the AIDS benefit. I had forgotten all about that bullshit. My nerves were shot. I promised myself I wouldn't sit through one more meeting or speech. Nada. But the pressure was on. Soldier was bossing everyone around, rehearsing Lauren about how to place the volunteers, security, etc. Dressed in red and white, the colors for all workers from the womanhood class, me, Lauren, and Soldier were on our way out the door. Doc's voice stopped us. Soldier, I'm sorry, I can't make it to the benefit. Not having a secretary left me in a bad position. Soldier looked disappointed. But here's a check for a thousand dollars to support the wonderful work that you're doing. Soldier gave her a hug and a kiss. I'm thinking, see, it ain't no sweat for her to just throw away a thousand dollars. One more thing, Doc said. I need Lauren's help today. I know how much you need her, but right now I don't have anybody else. Now, after Doc gave a thousand dollars, what could Soldier say? Lauren turned on the heels of her cheap shoes and went back into the house. Well, you've been around for months, Soldier said to me. You know how important this benefit is to me. I need your help today. Do you think you can handle it? At the church, Soldier went into the back with the important people. At 5 p.m., hundreds of ticket buyers started to file in one by one. By 6, the crowd was so big, they had to open the second balcony. Girls from the womanhood class in red skirts and white blouses stood against the wall every couple of feet. They were ushers They were ushers and security. More girls lined the wall on the now-packed balcony. Up on stage, Soldier was seated at a long table with doctors, dignitaries, and other stuffed shirts. And among all of the bulging crowd in their haste, they somehow left me at one of the three doors to collect money. I was amazed at this crowd of people I had never seen. Ladies with big church hats, men in suits with brims, Volvos, and Benzes. Even the young people had on suits and dresses. No sneakers to be found. The young, excuse me, um, not even a pair of baggy jeans and definitely no hats. There was an old man who stood at the entrance and reminded each boy to remove his hat. More surprising, however, was the flow of $20 bills piling up in my basket as I sat behind the table collected, excuse me, on one side and the two other girls, one of whom was Rashida, sat behind the table on the other side. I began to separate the ones, fives, tens, and twenties and turn all the dollar bills in the right direction the way daddy showed me to do. When the preacher said, let us bow our heads and pray, everyone bowed. I gently grabbed a stack of 20s, 10s, and 5s. I was not greedy. I left at least half in the basket. It was only a two-step motion dropping the bills into my red coach bag, the one I had purchased to match GS's Jeep. When heads raised from prayer, I was my calm, courteous self. I resumed taking funds from the latecomers and stra- stragglers. Mm, mm, mm. Lord Winter. This child. Uh, setting myself up for a flawless getaway, I told Rashida, who was always ripe for the sucker roll, that I had a terrible stomach ache. 
To gain her complete trust, I asked her to hold my money basket while I went to the bathroom. The bathroom was situated in the back of the church by the stage. I walked slowly and confidently to the back, checking on the ushers like I was the manager or something. It was so easy to give them orders and watch them follow. Just a little bit of authority in my voice and I had them all jumping. In the bathroom, overly helpful ladies chatted with each other. What a lovely church. Oh, are you a member? No. I am. Yes, our pastor is the best. How do you like our stained glass windows? Aren't they beautiful? This place is huge, isn't it? Sure, it seats at least 1,500 people. The 1,500 people sounded the loudest in my ears as I stood behind the door counting my new riches. $15 a person times 1,500 people. Without paper, I calculated $22 and a half thousand dollars. 7,000 of them were in my bag. My heart started to beat fast. The small space in the toilet seemed to get even smaller. My scalp busted a sweat. A couple of deep breaths and I was okay. Hell, aren't the benefits to raise money for those who need it? Why do people with AIDS need the money when they were just going to die anyway? I rolled the money up and placed it in rubber bands that I usually use for my hair. In my boldness, I walked to the front of the elevated stage. As soon as Soldier spotted me, she leaned over and asked, What's the matter? Are you okay? In the baby, in the baby voice, the one I watched Lauren use so effectively, I said, my stomach's going crazy. I just threw up in the bathroom. My mouth tastes so nasty. I'm so sorry. With a face full of concern, she responded, you've done a lot to help out. I have a check for you for all the work you've done for me when Lauren wasn't around. Just then, a young, suited man was at the podium introducing Soldier. Go to the house, she said. I have some baking soda. Now, I've never seen this word. What? Kaopectate? and Pepto-Bismol upstairs in the medicine cabinet, whichever you prefer. Lay down for a while. You'll feel better soon. In an unusual move, she planted a kiss on my cheek. As I looked at her, looked up at her in surprise, she smiled and said, in all the commotion, I forgot to tell you that I spoke to Bilal this morning. Who? Bilal. Midnight, she repeated. Your cousin? Gagging for air and holding my stomach. I said, oh, midnight. We'll talk. She shouted over the crowd's applause. She gestured goodbye with her hand, then stepped to the podium. A track star couldn't have been faster than me. My legs were carrying my body swiftly toward the house that was a little more than a few blocks away. I rang the bell. It took about five minutes for Lauren to answer the door. Even though I had my poker face on, my forehead was sweating too much for a winter afternoon. What's wrong, she asked. How did it go? It can't be over so soon. No, it just got started. Then what are you doing here? I got some serious stomach pains out of nowhere. Did you tell Soldier you believe in the church? Yeah, we talked. She sent me home to get some medicine. She said I should get it from upstairs in the medicine cabinet. Do you want to see Doc? No, I'm just going to take some of the kale pectate and head back to the church to help out. Oh, she said suspiciously. Upstairs, I ran into Soldier's bedroom. I took the key off her jewelry box, which was right on top of her cluttered dresser. I opened the file cabinet and flipped feverishly through the files. I had to check each one for the first name, Bilal. I didn't know his last name. Finally, I got to Bilal Ode. I grabbed the folder. I snatched the New York Times off Soldier's bed and placed the folder and all of its contents in between the pages to conceal it. In Lauren's room, I grabbed my empty Nike luggage bag and placed it inside everything that absolutely could not be left here. I surveyed Lauren's dresser for my belongings, saw my beeper, and threw it in the Nike bag. Out of nervousness, wait, so did she steal the file? Hold on. Finally, I got to Bilal all day. I grabbed the folder. I snatched the New York Times off a soldier's bed and placed the folder and all of its contents in between the pages to conceal it. In Lauren's room, I grabbed an empty Nike luggage bag and placed inside it everything that absolutely could not be left here. I surveyed Lauren's dresser for my belongings, saw my beeper, and threw it in the Nike bag. Out of nervousness, I checked my red coach bag again. No problem. My money was still there. I grabbed a roll of 20s, peeled off two of them, and slid them into my red leather jacket pocket for easy access. I opened the small drawer on the bureau and collected my diamond necklace, my bracelet, and my earrings. I put them into my red bag, my lipstick, hair comb, brush, and of course my box cutter were the last to go in. I double checked everything with my hands full. I stepped lightly down the five flights of stairs. I was so excited to be leaving this place forever. Panic racked my body when I hit the landing approaching the last flight of stairs. I was staring down at Lauren, who was standing at the front door, paying what appeared to be a delivery man. There must have been 20 medium-sized boxes covering the foyer floor. Are you going somewhere? Lauren asked. Yeah, back to the church. 
without saying anything, Lauren's eyes dropped down to my Nike bag. Oh, yeah, I didn't get a chance to see my mother yesterday. She was pretty upset, so I'm going to see her right after the benefit finishes. Oh, she says suspiciously. Well, can you help me out with these boxes before you leave? They're Doc's medical files. They're Doc's medical supplies. With my hands full, I looked at all the at all the 20 or so boxes i was hoping when lauren saw in my face that i really didn't want to do it and would say never mind but she didn't i was leery about acting different than normal so i agreed to help come on put all that stuff down four hands will be better than two i kept checking the clock as we moved the boxes the short distance from the foyer through the big wooden doors into the office the final destination was the supply closet no matter what, I kept sweating. Even my palms were sweating now. My heart was pounding so fast, I swore Lauren could hear it. I reassured myself I was being ridiculous. As soon as we finished, I picked up all my stuff, and casually as I could, I said, All right, Lauren, I'll see you either late tonight or tomorrow morning. Sure, thanks, she said. See you. Outside, the cab driver asked, Where are you headed to? Thanks, she ain't even mentioned nothing about calling the cab driver. <laughs> For seconds, nothing would come out of my mouth. I did not know. To a hotel, I finally said. What hotel? The Marriott in New Jersey, right over the bridge and off the highway. In Jersey? He repeated, that's going to cost you $35. No problem, but he still didn't move the cab. I reached into my pocket and gave him one of my 20s to get him to start driving. As I looked to my right, I saw Lauren's face disappear as the window curtain being held by her hand dropped back into place. We pulled off. When I opened the file tucked inside the New York Times, the first thing that fell out were old newspaper clippings. The first article I picked up had a picture of my father and our house in Long Island. The second paragraph mentioned me by name as well as my mother. Oh, so Soldier knew who she was the whole time. Mm. Fucking bitch, Soldier. I mumbled. She knew who I was all along, but the fact of the matter is, I got the last laugh. She would never be able to prove I took that money. She had too many people collecting it and no system to account for who had what. As I checked further into the file, there were letters and open envelopes and loose papers. Some letters were from Midnight to Soldier. The papers were copies of letters from Soldier to Midnight. There would be no more secrets. I was going to look through everything and read every word. Most importantly, I would soon discover, I hope, where Midnight lays his head at night. We need a major credit card to secure your registration, ma'am, the lady at the desk said. You don't take cash? Yes, if you would like to pay cash, that'll be fine. It'll be $200 for the room and $20 refundable deposit for the phone. Happy to shut the snotty receptionist up, I unzipped my coach bag and reached in for my roll of 20s. Instead, I pulled out two bottles of wet and wild lip gloss and a half-eaten chocolate chip cookie. I stood staring at my own hands if I had six fingers. The picture frame froze. Everything in front of my eyes stuck in the same motionless position. Lauren, described by my sister as the trickster, had switched, described by her sister as the trickster, had switched her red leather coach bag with mine. <gasps> oh, wow. The picture frame froze. Everything in front of my eyes stuck in the same motionless position. Lauren, described by her sister as the trickster, had switched her red leather coach bag with mine. As I squatted down to check the bag, not because I had hopes that it was mine, but I disbelief, I flipped it over and emptied its contents onto the hotel carpet. That was There was nothing of value in the bag. The inside stunk from the odor of two bottles of rubber alcohol she had in there. She must have thrown these in last minute so I wouldn't notice the weight change. As every muscle in my body collapsed from the sheer stress of the situation, my butt hit the floor. The voice of the hotel woman was flying over the counter and dropping down onto my ears. Excuse me, miss, do you want the room? I'll be back, I called to her. I used my hands to sweep all the junk, except the crumbs, back into the bag. I walked away in slow motion, lifting my Nike bag off the bellhop's trolley. Oh, wow. Dang. She got her good. Should I go into reading chapter 16? Nah, I'm going to stop right there. All right, I appreciate y'all for tuning in. I'm going to go upload this on my YouTube channel. And we'll be back with chapter 16 another day and another time. I'll keep y'all posted. Thanks for tuning in. All right, peace. Have a good evening.